So today I'm going to be presenting a bit of a uh, expose on RP21, uh, which was the refit period in which C3030 was implemented. <clears throat> what I'm going to be running through is AMP and Chules's road to the refit. What was the C3030 program? My perspective during the refit, some key changes that we delivered during the refit. I'll talk about some of the major challenges and then right at the end there, I'll tie a nice, warm, fuzzy, good news story to tie it all together. And you'll have some time for questions at the end. AMP and uh, Chules' Road to Refit. So when I first started on the island, I noticed a small company named AMP somehow got their way into the island as one of the uh, primes for HMAS Chules. And it really astounded me as a young fellow how they got a foot in amongst the big primes like Talus and BAE and all that. Well, it turns out AMP aren't actually that small. We actually operate 11 dry docks up and down the UK. And I think there was a stat thrown out there that we dock up to 200 ships a year, which absolutely astounded me. Uh, I had to check that figure. So it's a true figure. In 2012, HMAS Chules was bought by the Australian Navy for about $100 million. And it was only ever meant for a bit of a stopgap in our amphibious capability. So AMP UK at the time was brought over with about four employees, a mixture of ex-ship staff, some of which are in the room right now, under an interim contract. And then in 2012, HMAS Chules was accepted into the longer term future of the Australian Navy, uh, at which point AMP was given an in-service support contract, growing to about 25 employees, and they delivered that contract for about four years there before C3030 was announced. And C3030 was for the first time ever awarded to the in-service support um, contractor there, which is a, a big step for AMP growing to about 85 employees today. So what was the C3030 program? So the major goal of this refit was a capability assurance program. What that might mean to some people in the room might mean different things. But the overall goal was to assure the current capability of the ship. It wasn't to increase capability, add guns and all that kind of good stuff. It was there to assure the capability for the next 15 years going forward. So under the program, we initially had a list of about 44 engineering changes, discrete engineering changes. And that quickly grew, you'll see here, I've crossed out 44. That quickly grew to about 57 engineering changes. So under the thing, I'll run through these very quickly. You can all read the slides, but we've got the HVAC upgrade, dry exhaust upgrade, ballast water treatment facilities, new galley, new ribs, new fresh water production plants, which is what RO stand for, new sewage treatment, new stability, oh, sorry, stability upgrades. We replaced the propulsion converters, installed some diesel crankcase breather systems. We upgraded the work in air. We did fixed fire, fired in upgrades. Uh, we actually... <laughs> We're in the process of installing a new radar. We did some IPMS upgrades and we also did include some capability additions to the ship. One of which is the Seawiz Close and Weapon System, which is uh, a system that shoots missiles out of the air to protect the ship, the Nixie decoy system and personnel and magazine ballistic protection. You'll see here I've actually included a, a picture here of HMAS tools and our company model motto on there, which is delivering success together. You'll see through the slides, I actually give a bit of kudos to some of the contractors that we work to, because we do firmly believe that AMP success is built on delivering success together. So the refit period in numbers, 15. This was actually the largest refit that was delivered on Garden Island in the last 15 years since the FFG upgrade, 180. That was the millions of dollars for the budget for the C3030 program. Lachlan, can you hear me? It's uh, Sean Feenan speaking. I'm online. Uh, your slides aren't uh, following your uh, script. We're still seeing the opening slide. What does this button do? I can see you now. How's that, guys? Yep, now we've got it. We're up to refit period, yep, in numbers. Very good. Thank you for the heads yep. up. Uh, what, what isn't talked about in the period is uh, the in-service support work that uh, we're doing in parallel. So 
the docking was actually a major 60 monthly docking and the primary focus of that was to certify the ship for the next five years before the next docking. Under that uh, contract, the in-service support contract, we delivered 1,500 planned maintenance tasks, almost 500 corrective work orders. And we spent $11 million in just other support services like scaffold, tank cleaning, painting, all, all that good stuff that goes along that nobody talks about. 38, that's the uh, number of weeks we had in production, eight even of which was in dock, and we tied her up for 17 weeks and completed the job. 675,000, that was the number of man hours spent during the refit. And so that gives you an idea of the magnitude of the change. And that was utilizing 2,500 individuals. A bit of a uh, good news point here is we had zero major safety instances. We did have a few minor safety instances, which you should expect on any refit uh, planned for. And we only had eight man hours of lost time due to injury. So my perspective during the refit, this is what I'm going to be focusing on. So to give you an idea of where I'm coming from with this presentation. My perspective during the refit was I joined AMP in 2019 when the design phase of the refit was already well underway. I picked up a couple of design tasks, uh, task owner for a few design tasks being RO plants, sewage treatment plants, the vacuum sewage system upgrades. And I was also the production task owner for those jobs, plus the uh, removal routes during the refit. Also took part in sea trials, um, which is really good to work alongside ship staff, uh, get the system set to work, commissioned, and get the ship uh, back to its material state. First major change I'll talk about was the dry exhaust system upgrade. So you, you might ask, why on earth would you rip out the whole exhaust of the ship and replace it with a new one? The primary reason for this change was actually uh, personnel safety. The You'll see in this slide, you can see the blue outline of the new exhaust. And then if you trace that back aft end of the helicopter, the stacks actually came out just at the back end of the uh, flight deck there. So the Navy guys would be during uh, more in operations, they'd be on the flight deck or shade deck, taking their posts. And every now and again, they'd get a big plume of black smoke right in their face, which obviously isn't ideal. So I was one of the major drivers. The other issue was a wet exhaust system has inherent issues. Um, you got pipework running through the ship, it was thick walled mild steel and over the last 15 years it become corroded and to a non-serviceable state again very expensive to maintain uh the other inherent issue was flooding of the engines so this actually occurred during build they flooded the engines uh, this is it's quite an easy thing that can happen it's not just operator error the soot can get into the drainage pipes fill up the, the uh, dosing section of the exhaust and back flood into the engine this also occurred under ran operation which is Royal Australian Navy operation. The other thing I put here is environmental optics. So you'd be in harbour, you'd start the engines, turbos would kick in, and then a big black soot would just flow into the harbour. Apparently it got cleared by the environmental protection agencies, but it wasn't a great look for the Australian Navy. And what did we do? So the nuts and bolts of it are, we ripped all the exhaust out, we put new exhaust in and we put the stacks at the midships up high instead of at the, at the back end. I'll put this photo here in which I'm trying to give you an idea of the magnitude of this task. So you can see this was actually taken by our very own Rob Nuttall in this case. He was standing up on a five metre uh, high platform in the well dock. These platforms were extending probably 50 to 100 metres both sides of the dock. He's actually looking at some of the rises there which you can kind of see on the model uh, down in this section here. So obviously there's plenty of pipe work coming in, plenty of rigging, uh, thousands of man hours going into this task. You can see in some of these photos, we actually had to cut holes to get gear in and out, um, serious magnitude task. And this was less than 10% of the total expenditure of the refit. You can uh, see some of our design installation partners on this on this page. So kudos to all the team that worked on that. Um, and the success of this one was primarily probably not seen just yet, but during more in operations, as I mentioned, um, and the decreased maintenance cost, which we'll see over the next few years. We also had an added bonus of additional compartments in the uh, off the shade decks there, there's another seven or eight compartments which are freed up by the removal of the wet exhaust system. So they're used for new machinery that we've installed, storage spaces. There's just a few more compartments to add to the ship. 
Next change I'll talk about is the HVAC upgrades. So this was actually the largest change that we did on the refit. Um, since we got the ship, we were really fighting an uphill battle with coolings. This ship was built for British conditions, obviously a little bit more chilly over there. When it came down to Australia, we retrofitted uh, a few surplus chillers or additional chillers to help out the load, um, which you see the 450s and the 70s. In addition to the mains, we had limited redundancy. If one of the main chillers went out, it was, a, it was actually a major issue for the ship. And the aging chillers were really starting to show their age and uh, the maintenance costs were also going through the roof. So removed all the old chillers. You'll see them in red on this diagram here. And we installed five new thousand kilowatt uh, chillers into the system. And with the combined five megawatts of cooling cool in on the ship now, we've increased the capacity by about 35% and adding some real redundancy there. Under this change, big job. So we installed about 1.4 kilometers worth of 150, 150 mil bore pipe work, which was Cooney and mild steel. And that doesn't include all the uh, smaller pipe work, which isn't talked about. There's a lot more of that. It's three and a half kilometers of electrical cable we whacked in. We overhauled all the air conditioning units, we ripped out the guts of them, all the fan coils you can see in that photo. Some of the coils on the FCUs or AHUs, not sure what that is, um, looking very tired. So we replaced all the coils out of there, new uh, continuous uh, flow valves and control valves, uh, new fan speed controllers. And this change affected uh, more than 60 compartments across the ship. So you're probably picking up that this is a big job and you'll see all the installation partners we were working with here. I think by the end, we were happy to use anyone that will take our money in then because of the uh, shortage of labor on, on the ship. And managing this many subbies across this many compartments over a long period, we were bound to have leaks. So this was one of the big challenges. We ended up having to stand up a team, about a dozen people, all with radios, running around the ship looking for leaks. Um, and this was a bit of a fun time, good team bonding session as we uh, found leaks around the team. I think one of the Irish lads had probably watched a little bit too much TV and ended up calling us the leaky finders. <laughs> Bigger, another big challenge in this project was obviously items coming out of Europe. So these chillers, we designed and built pretty much the whole change bar the chillers in country. So it's a massive win for Australian industry content, not something that had really been done in Australia before. We're actually going to build these chillers in Australia with all the componentry brought out from Europe. That didn't actually eventuate just because of the supply chain issues in Europe. So these chillers end up getting their very own first class flight all the way from Europe, straight off the truck and into the ship. And you can see uh, Adam and I up on the flight deck there doing our very best impersonation of a uh, site supervisor. <clears throat> Next change we'll talk about to the Bowsworth uh, treatment system. Anyone that's been around the industry knew in 2017, there was an IMO circle that came around that mandated that you must treat your ballast water so you're not polluting uh, ports from different parts around the world. Um, HMAS Tools was no exception of this. And if you've been down in the bottom levels of a ship, you'll, you'll know that there's pumps, there's pipe work, there's not a lot of room to move. So installing a UV reactor, big filters, electrical cabinets, it was always going to be a challenge. Thankfully, uh, our of our offer a modular system, which was uh, very helpful to us. It was still very challenging. Uh, we had major rework in AMR1 with uh, ballast pumps and new ballast water treatment. We had the new chillers going in the same space. A lot of 3D modeling you'll see in these photos. On the left there, we've got the uh, compartment all modeled up. So it all fits on the model, first step. And then the middle photo, Taylor Brothers have actually uh, fabricated the whole lot. That's prior to galvanization. And then the third photo there, all fit in the ship, all galvanized, all done, ready to go. This is actually the auxiliary machinery space up forward. The aft spaces on HMAS tools in the ballast pump room. I didn't actually include any photos on here because all you would see is uh, a foot of space, then a pump, then another foot of space, and then a pipe. So uh, AMR1 was actually the easy compartment for us. The removal routes. Uh, this. This was not actually an official task in the period, but obviously we had to cut some holes to get some gear out and get some gear in. 
we had six major inserts cut in the ship. Uh, these are about five by three meters in size. Um, AMR1 up forward there. To support the ballast water treatment, sewage treatment plants and a chiller. AMR2 to support two chillers, two RO plants and a few water mist units for the new firefighting capability. We have the technical equipment rooms, both port and starboard, out with the old chiller, in with the new. And uh, the internal inserts are a little bit different and I'll touch on these very shortly. We had the, uh, out with the old converters and in with the new. Um, you probably saw a photo just previously of the dry exhaust inserts in the top of the ship. And there was many, many more up and down the ship to support tank work, dry exhaust and other jobs. To support this task, there was a whole bunch of jigs that had to be designed, platforms and jigs. And you'll see the photo on the left there, it looks like it was taken on a potato and that's because it's from early 2000. And the photo on the right there is in 2021. Those platforms actually look quite similar. And the reason for that is they are actually, actually the exact same platform. So for anyone getting a little bit nostalgic, there was the same platform using the FFG upgrade and HMO's tools. So I want to explain to you the process of cutting an insert because I know we've got a wide range of uh, experience in the room and online here. So I've, I'll walk you through the process of cutting an insert because for me, there was actually a, a new thing. So we model it all up, model the hull of the ship, get the uh, holes cut in the ship, platforms in place. And the very first week of the ship coming in dock, we drop the platform in place and start welding and we start cutting it out. So we're using grinders, gas axes, anything that gets steel moving. There was a lot of hammering, a lot of swearing down there, but eventually these inserts come out and are lifted away. We line the gear up inside. We skate it out on uh, little skateboards, essentially. We line it all up and get it ready to be lifted out with uh, large lifting jigs. I think on the right there, we got our very own Murray Macon from the Institute. I think it might be online tonight. Thanks for letting me use that photo, Murray. That's all the gear out before Christmas, which was, uh, in Murray's very own words, a job half done. The converter rooms were a little bit different because the inserts for this job were actually internal to the ship. The photo on the left there, you can actually see a very clean looking well dock, which made the uh, safety team very happy. Um, the telehandler, really tight spaces in that, in that area, lifting out the old propulsion converters and getting the new ones in there. And then on the right there, the inserts all welded back up, MPI'd and ready to accept paint. The tech equipment rooms are actually my favorite ones that we did because they presented their own uh, unique challenges being some 15 meters up above the dock floor. On the starboard side of the ship, we threw a whole bunch of dock blocks down there, put the platform on top of the dock blocks and that's how the boys got up and down, well, boys and girls got up and down that platform. And then on the port side, which you can see in this photo, is actually a hanging platform. Uh, this blew my mind a little bit at the time because they fabricated this one up, hung it on the ship, welded it to the ship uh, with essentially just big hooks. We low tested the thing to about 10 or 15 ton, uh, proved it's good to go. And then we built a scaffold tower down four stories down to the platform uh, for access to the platform. Uh, our design and install partner for this one was Talus. Uh, they did some really good work on this. Um, we will form behind schedule there for a while, some 3%, and we recovered that um, to get the ship out of dock on time. Really good work. Now, the underwater hull coating. Most people probably... Um, <clears throat> they wouldn't talk about painting the bottom of a ship. It's pretty run of the mill. But for this one, it was a very last minute change, which actually changes paint spec I don't know, probably a month before we were actually due to paint the ship. So you can imagine uh, getting this fancy paint in was always going to be against the wire. And the reason we did this, that photo in the middle of the page there, it's not in the middle of a depth of a cage or a uh, cave somewhere deep down. That's actually the bottom of HMO's tools the last few times she came in from docking. The hull was absolutely hanging both times it came in. So... Part of that reason was this HMS Jewels is in a ferry. It's not running through the water. There's no water going over the hull most of the time. The predominant operating of Jewels is stationary, bringing troops in and out. So that's, that's what happens. So we brought this new Hempel X7 code in. It's a silicon-based coating with a biocide in there. Um, you can see some empirical data here, which is quite impressive. We had a 10 to 15% fuel saving um, when we were running the ship at sea trials. 
which is actually a one and a half to three and a half percent increase in propeller RPM. And the results were seen in the latest diving inspection some 15 months after we put the ship back in the water, put some divers down there, bit of a wave of the a hand over the hull and the growth was essentially gone. It's actually looking really, really good. The challenges during C3030 and RP21, the refit period. The main challenge was the sheer volume of work that we threw into this period. Um, I think Eric last presentation spoke about the shortage of um, nuclear physicists in the country. It was always going to be a problem. But it's not just nuclear physicists that are short in this country. It's also things like welders, boilermakers, sparkies. We've got a real shortage everywhere. As I mentioned earlier, we, we were willing to use anyone that would take our money by the end. Um, and there's some serious, serious bodies moving on site. This may sound like a simple one, but hot work permits, if you do hot work on a naval vessel, produce a spark, produce heat, you need a hot work permit. Typically, we run a period and we'd issue five to 10 hot work permits a day. In this period, we'd be running at 45 hot work permits, sometimes up to 100. We actually had to bring in more staff to assist ship staff in this uh, process. Craneage, there was over 12,000 lifts through the period. We had four cranes operating at a few times, two up aft, two up forward. Confined spaces, we need rescue teams for men, to, men and ladies to enter confined spaces. Normally, we run a four-man team in this period wouldn't be uncommon to see 16 to 20 rescue staff on site ready to rescue people from confined spaces. Uh, Deconfliction was obviously a massive thing for task owners and the project managers alike. Um, we had many, you saw, you saw an AMR one, you got three major tasks going on in, in concurrence, plus all the maintenance tasks would be 20 bodies in a quite a tight space. So. It's a lot of work from, from the team to maintain the harmony within the team and keep everyone safe as well. You can see in that photo on the left, that's actually the side ramp opening up over the AMR2 insert. Side ramp has got painted, had its maintenance going on. And in AMR2, we were on the critical path for the, the whole refit, really, for the whole docking. Um, so little things like opening a side ramp, losing day or two here, it was a major thing for us. That photo on the right there is actually in the well dock. You can see the sheer volume of gear that's brought in and out. Um, really clogging up the space and the scaffold, that well dock was covered in scaffold. Many, many tons of scaffold. Um, simple thing, but really, really a lot of work in that space. I think we've all forgotten we're all in this room not wearing masks anymore. So everyone thinks COVID-19 was... Uh, Thing that happened in the past and it was hopefully we actually lost 19,000 almost 20,000 man hours of time due to COVID-19 um, I think the whole AMP project team at one stage or another got COVID except for one uh, very proud 52 year old British man who apparently was uh, too tough to get COVID-19 um, the rain delay so at the time, all I knew is I had wet boots for four months straight. I didn't actually know how wet it was. I was doing a bit of research for this uh, presentation. And that, that uh, graph that you can see in the bottom left there, the purple line represents a very wet year for Sydney. And the red line is where we're at on the 8th of April, some two weeks after we undocked the ship. That graph was thrown into the news there. Um, we also had the European unrest. We obviously knew the war in Europe kicked off. Uh, and the supply chain was really tough to get things out of Europe. Yeah, tying it all together with a nice, warm, fuzzy, good news story. So with uh, the changes that happened, new propulsion converters, we upgraded the HVAC, we had some serious cooling improvement, our new streamlined hull coating, and the general in-service pod maintenance that we did on the ship actually allowed the ship to achieve lever 10, which is maximum output through the pods for the first time in the uh, past six years for the ship. So it was a massive win. We went to sea trials and as you can imagine, all these changes coming together and being commissioned at the same time for the ship to go to sea on time. It was a real major win and it should not be understated how, how big a deal this was for the ship to get out there on time. No, no defect rectification period as well. And successful set to work of really all the systems with no real major um, hiccups. 
I say no major hiccups, but it was a challenging time for the team. Uh, one of the boys is really pushing me to include a video, which was a nice media video of AMP and flyovers and all that stuff. And then you see Eagles right at the end with a hammer banging on the pipes because we couldn't get water through this pipe on the day. And I thought I'd better not because the MD might have kittens. <laughs> Where to from here? So AMP continued to deliver HMAS Chules in service support. Chules continues to be ready and available prior to the fleet, in my opinion. And we could look to continue naval engineering support for the uh, wider Navy community.